0.5. Um, curvature and acceleration. And I told you last time that we I would show you a shortcut for when we're working in in rectangular coordinates in the plane. So let's let's look at that real quick. So last time we came up with our our uh, uh, a formula for curvature. We said that our curvature k was r prime cross r double prime magnitude divided by r prime cubed. And we said this was usually going to be the formula that's easiest to calculate, uh, to calculate curvature with. If we're in rectangular coordinates in the plane, um, and we have a curve, y equals f of x, we can, uh, we can write this as a vector valued function by saying that r is x i plus f of x j. And we'll add, I'm just going to add my 0 k. So we're in the plane, so we don't have a k component. And our prime, if we take the derivative, we're going we're to calculate, calculate our curvature in the plane and come up with an expression that's, that's a little easier to work with than this one if, we're just use, if we have just uh, two two components of our vector. So r prime is going to be i plus f prime j. And the length of r prime is just the square root of 1 plus f prime squared. And r double prime is just going to be f double prime j. So we're going to plug this into our formula for curvature, into our, into this formula for curvature to come up with a simplified expression when we're in the plane. So if we do our cross product, r prime cross r double prime, we end up with, I'm not going to go through the calculation, we just get f double prime <coughs> Okay, and the length of r prime cross r double prime is just the length of f double prime of x. So if we plug this into our, if we plug our expressions, all of our expressions into our formula for curvature, we end up with in the plane that k equals um, the magnitude of f double prime of x divided by 1 plus f prime of x squared to the 3 halves. So in the plane, if you have just a function of x and y, or just your, your, you have a two-dimensional vector, this is going to be the, fo the <coughs> formula that you want to calculate curvature with, because our cross products, our cross product simplifies, and our length simplifies to, to this. So this makes your life a lot simpler in the plane. Any questions on that? And you could go through if you if you uh, if you didn't remember this, you could go through and calculate this using using this as your as your vector value function, and so come up with a curvature. You just end up going through the steps of finding this rather than just going to it directly. <coughs> All right, so I want to kind of, the, our, our book kind of glances, kind of 
skips over the, the next topic a little bit. I just want to talk about it really quickly because I think it's really, really interesting. Um, I want to talk about the, um, the osculating circle. <coughs> So our, our, our book talks about it a little bit. So, so far we've, we've been talking about we have a curve and our curvature is K at some point. Um, and we said that, so K is a curvature. The radius of curvature is 1 over K. So our radius of curvature is, uh, is R1 over K. Um, we call the circle, the circle with radius R, that is tangent to the curve at a point P. We call that the osculating circle. <coughs> and osculate means to uh, to kiss. So, and we we also call this the circle circle of curvature. And the, the circle of curvature is, the, the reason it's important is, one, uh, the, uh, the osculating circle, the curvature matches the curve at point P, and the tangents are the same at point P. So we have the, the, the osculating circle and the curve have the same tangent vector, and they have the same curvature. So that circle is the best match, the, best, the circle of best match for the curve at that point. So kind of like when we talk about a line of best fit, for, for a set of data. The osculating circle is the circle of best fit at that particular point. Um, and the center of the circle, the center of the osculating circle, is called the center of curvature. So let me draw a quick sketch and um, we can figure out the center of curvature and we can find an equation of the osculating circle. Um, so here is my coordinate system. <coughs> I don't want dotted lines. And we'll have a, our circle in there. So here's my osculating circle. And let me draw my curve that's tangent. See if I can see if I can do this. So there's my, there's my curve. And here is point P where they're, where they match up. And at this point, K is 1 over R, 1 over the radius. So let me draw in a few vectors here. Here is our position vector. So there's R. Here's the center of the osculating circle, the center of the circle of curvature. Um, and let me draw in this, this vector. And finally, my third vector. So the vector from the origin to the center is the vector to the center of the circle of curvature. I'm going to call that C. This vector, because, because the circle is the circle and the curve share the tangent vector, this vector is in the direction of the unit normal vector. 
So this vector is going to be r, the radius, times r is not a, a vector, r times n, where n is our unit normal vector. Let me redraw that. So we can find the center of curvature, c is r plus the radius of curvature times our unit normal vector. So this is the way we can find the, the coordinates of the center of the circle of curvature. And our book just very briefly mentions the osculating circle and the circle of curvature. And I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so here's an easy way to find the center of curvature so we can find the equation of the circle if we were interested in, in the circle. And you can get lots of interesting curves from the circle of curvature. If you trace along the point at the center of the circle of curvature as it goes along the curve, that's called the, the cur those curves are called evolutes. And then uh, there's other curves that are related to the, to the circle of curvature also. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the circle of curvature, the circle of curvature is in the plane defined by T and N. And one of the problems in the homework, it asked you to, to calculate uh, B, the binormal vector, which was T cross N. And uh, the binormal vector is going to be perpendicular, going to be orthogonal to, the, to both T and N. And the binormal vector, as you go along the curve, the measure of how much that binormal vector changes in time tells you about how the curve twists. So the binormal vector, the rate of change of the binormal vector is a measure of the twist of the curve. And I wanted to show you these um, demos really quick that I found last night that show the sense, some, center, some circles of curvature and gives you the idea of this, this twist of the curve. So... Let's see, is that osculating circles? Okay, let's do this one first. All right, so here is our, here's a curve. And what, the, what this little demo does is, is drawn the osculating circle at various points. And then we can just drag the pointer around and see how the osculating circle changes. And what do you think is going to happen at an inflection point? It's a line. The curvature is 0. And now, as we go around, the curvature is maximum at a minimum of the curve, or at a maximum. And then we go along there. And here's a trigonometric curve. And there's our osculating circle. And here's a logarithmic curve. Not as interesting. The next one, the next one is really interesting because this, these are so those are plane curves. This one is, this one's a curve in space. So if I turn it around, you can see the curve. Now, as we move the osculating, as we move the point, the osculating circle is not only going to get bigger or smaller the plane of the osculating circle is going to change. And that, that as the plane changes, that's, that's that binormal. The, the binormal vector is going to be normal to the plane of the osculating circle. So as we move around, the osculating circle changes its plane. And that m is a measure of how twisty... Is it going around the... the yeah, it's going around, around the curve. So, so when the 
when the circle's flattened out, this circle now is in a plane like this. And then as I move down, as we move along the curve, now it's in a plane closer to the plane of the screen. And now it's turned again. Now it's in a plane that's it's like the circle's coming out of the screen towards us, a huge circle coming out of the screen towards us. Now it's more in the plane of the screen again. Now it's in a plane that's perpendicular to the screen. <coughs> so the osculating circle is changing planes as we move around the curve. And let's look at a helix. So here's, I think this one's fun. So here's a helix, and the osculating circle on the helix <laughs> No, because the radius of curvature of a helix, if I turn this this way, it's just a circle, right? So the circle of curvature, I don't have it exactly um, lined up, but the circle of curvature is going to have the same uh, same radius. So here's an elliptical helix where the circle changes radius because the curvature does change. And let's turn it and we'll look at it in the um, It twists a little bit. So anyway, I just I, I think the idea of a, the osculating circle and the circle of curvature is kind of interesting, so I wanted to talk a little more about it. Um, so <clears throat> now let's go back to acceleration and curvature. So we talked about the osculating circle a little bit, give you a little bit of, of background on that. Um, if you go further in in calculus, what what we're doing this this chapter and and part of what we're doing is is kind of in the in the area of of differential geometry. So we're, we're applying calculus to curves and surfaces. So that's, that's called differential geometry, which is kind of a, a subfield of topology. So if you apply calculus to curves, you get differential geometry. If you apply set theory, you get set theory to curves and surfaces. You get, um, let's see, is that topology? And if you apply abstract algebra to curves and surfaces, you get um, algebraic geometry. So just depending on how we're analyzing our surfaces, you get these different things. So we're, we're touching a little bit on differential geometry here, applying calculus to curves and surfaces, which is kind of, kind of fun. All right, um, our acceleration. We're going back to acceleration and curvature, the gist of our, of our chapter. We said that our acceleration, we broke it down into components that were tangent and normal, to our, to our curve, we found the tangential component and normal component, and we found that the acceleration was dv dt times our unit tangent vector plus the length of v times the length of t prime times our unit normal vector. And we're just going to manipulate these a little bit. Um, to come up with a, a different, a different um, expression for our, for our curvature, one that, that might be a little more familiar to you in, uh, in physics. And we said that t prime, the length of t prime was the TDS magnitude, and we could simplify that to, that's how we defined our curvature the magnitude of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length. And VSVT we decided was the magnitude of our prime, which is the velocity. So we can say that T our unit tangent vector 
Uh, yes, you're right. I forgot my magnitude. Speed. So our unit tangent vector is the speed times our curvature. Um, and finally, we can write that our acceleration is the rate of change of the speed times a unit tangent vector plus the magnitude of V squared times K times M. Um, does anybody see another, another way that I could write this component of acceleration? that might be familiar to, to you physics people. <laughs> um, what's, uh, how is the curvature related to the radius of curvature? V squared over R. And what do we, in physics, what do you call V squared over R? What kind of acceleration? Centripetal acceleration. So our curvature, our curvature is related to our centripetal acceleration. Um, now if we want to write our acceleration just in terms of our arc length parameter, Remember, that's how we defined our, our curvature. And I'm going to switch, switch pages. <coughs> so our acceleration, our, our curvature is related to our centripetal acceleration or our normal component of acceleration. And this, this tells us how they're related. And if we want to write this in terms of our parameter, our arc length parameter, We can say <coughs> we know that dS dt is our speed. So our acceleration with respect to time is the second derivative of the arc length with respect to time times t plus k times the SBT squared times N. So this is our acceleration just written in terms of the arc length parameter. I forgot it's two here. <coughs> And we can, we, we can say that, that the magnitude of V squared over R is our centripetal, centripetal acceleration. So now we know all about curvature. Any questions? In other chapters. Um, Don't, we don't really talk about curvature, curvature much, much after this. The arc length parameter is very important in later chapters, and we'll use the arc length parameter to help us with uh, a surface area parameter also. So we're going to parameterize surfaces uh, in, in, in a lot, kind of the same way. So this, this arc length parameter and the surface, surface area parameter are going to be important as we, as we go forward. But the next chapter, chapter 13, is all about derivatives.
And we get to learn a fun new symbol in chapter 13 also. Um, <clears throat> and we, chapter 13, 14, and 15 will learn all kinds of new symbols. We'll get to write new, new calculus, new math symbols. <clears throat> um, let's do a couple of examples. Um, we want, we have uh, y equals x minus 1 squared plus 3. And we want to find, find where the curvature is maximum. And we want to find the limit as not k approaches infinity, as x approaches infinity of the curvature. So based on the little demonstration that we saw, where, what, what, first, what kind of curve is this? Parabola. Where is the, based on the demonstration we saw, where is the curvature going to be maximum? At the minimum or at the vertex? And what do you think the limit as x approaches infinity the curvature is going to be for a parabola? One, one, one person thinks infinity. We've got a couple of zeros. So the, does, the, does the parabola flatten out or, or get more curvy as x approaches infinity? Flatten out. So the curvature would be zero. So let's, let's verify that. Um, we're going to use uh, we're going to use the formula that we just just talked about. K is the magnitude of y double prime over one plus y prime squared to the three halves. So y prime is calculate our derivative. Y prime is two times x minus one, and y double prime is just 2. So this is a nice easy one to calculate with. So our curvature is just 2 over 1 plus 4 times x minus 1 squared to the 3 halves. And as x approaches infinity, k approaches Zero, just like we thought. Um, and where are we going to have the maximum curvature? So we, we could we could take the derivative of the curvature with respect to x and set it equal to zero. But just looking at this expression, where is it going to be, where is it going to be maximized? When the denominator is smallest, right? So where is the denominator smallest? When x equals 1, when this, this evaluates to 0. So maximum curvature at x equals 1. And when x equals 1, y equals 3 which is our vertex, just like we guessed. So we have the maximum curvature at the vertex, and as x approaches infinity, our curvature goes, approaches zero, just like our little circle in our demonstration. Um, let's, let's look at another one. And before we start calculating, let's, let's think about it. Um, y equals x minus 1 cubed plus 3. And we want to know curvature equals 0. So first, what does this, what does this curve look like? <laughs> so let's uh, what what is 
Okay. So we get kind of a, a flattened out S, right? And where is it going to cross the x-axis? Or does it, where, where is it going to, where is it going to be, where is it going to be in the middle of that flat part? One, one, three, right? So it's going to look something like, something like that. And this is at the point one, three. So where would you guess, this is not a great sketch, but based on what you know about how the, what this curve looks like, where would you guess that the curvature is zero? At that point. At that point. That's where it's flat, right? Yeah. And what, what other kind of point does this curve have here at 1, 3? Thinking back to calculus 1. Point of interest? Flips, flips, flips direction. The inflection point, the concavity changes. A critical point. Our, our slope is going to be zero there. So if our concavity changes, our curvature is going to go from, if it's concave down and goes to concave up, our curvature changes from positive to negative. In between negative and positive, what does it have to go through? Zero, zero right? So our, our curvature, we think our curvature is going to be zero at the point one, three. So let's verify that. We'll take uh, y prime equals 3 times x minus 1 squared. Y double prime is 6 times x minus 1. Plug it into our formula for curvature. Our curvature is the absolute value of 6 times x minus 1 over 1 plus 3 times x minus 1 squared. We'll square that and we'll raise this whole thing to the 3 halves power. Um, and our curvature is going to be 0 when the numerator is 0. Or at x equals 1 and at x equals 1, y equals 3. So we verified analytically that what we thought about our curvature is correct. And the other day I said we, we defined curvature in a particular way. And when you make, I said my professor said when you make your definition, nobody can touch you. Meaning if you define it that way, you stick with it uh, as long as it makes sense. So what we've been pointing out is the way that we've defined curvature makes sense in terms of how we intuitively think of curvature. and when we work with it analytically, it agrees with um, it, it agrees with our notion of what curvature should be. So that that kind of suggests that we've made made a definition that that makes good good mathematical sense. It, it analytically it agrees with the way we think it should behave. If we if we found if we made a definition and we found that it didn't agree with the way we thought it should behave, or there was something inconsistent when we applied when we used it analytically, then we might have to go back and change our definition because we want our definition to be, we want our, our math to be consistent. And when we finally get to talk about the incompleteness theorem that I've been talking about after the CML that we would talk about at some point, that, that idea of consistency is important to the incompleteness theorem. So there's a big, uh, big tangent there. All right, uh, homework. <coughs> There you go. And that is the end of chapter 12. All right. <laughs>